continue our series in the study of the work of the Holy Spirit through the Bible for a few more weeks and we're into Romans this morning and I'm going to divide what I have to say into two parts, the mini-sermon first and then the main one and the mini-sermon is taken from Romans 5, the first five verses so we'll read that now and then I'll talk to you about them. Then in a moment we look at Romans 7 and 8. Romans 5 Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. I want to speak this morning about a problem which only Christians have, and therefore, if you have never had the problem of which I'm going to speak, you would do well to ask whether you are really a Christian at all. This problem is one that every one of the disciples of Jesus had, and they all had it together on the same occasion. Jesus asked them all to ensure that he got a little bit of privacy on the last night of his life. And they were quite incapable of doing this. He left them at the gate of the Garden of Gethsemane and said, Now watch. I'm going to pray and I want you to watch to see that I'm not disturbed. And when he came back after a short interval, they were all asleep. And Jesus said one thing which pinpoints the problem which every Christian has and nobody else has. It may be summed up in our Lord's words to them, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And this tension this civil war, this wretched frustration is known by every true Christian sooner or later. It's the tension between what we ought to be and what in fact we are. A Christian has accepted higher standards than anyone else in the world. A Christian has accepted the ideal of God and God's laws as the guide for his life. And he is quite determined to live like that. And then sooner or later he discovers that he does not live like that. And that God's standards are way above him. Now this is a critical point in the Christian life when you experience this. Alas, many, many Christians settle the tension by settling for less than God's best. And the little doggerel I've quoted to you before comes in here. When I was young, I set my goal as far as I could see, but now I'm nearer to my goal, I've moved it nearer me. And middle-aged Christians in particular often get out of this problem by reducing their standards and saying, well, no one's perfect, and if I just try to do my best, my best, that surely that will be good enough for God. But the real Christian knows perfectly well that my best is not God's best and that there is a huge gap between these two things. Now, Romans 5 and Romans 7 and 8 deals with this problem which I would call the problem of being a spiritual spastic. Now, we know what the physical spastic condition is. It's a most frustrating condition. Near our former church was a home for spastics. And it was so difficult at first to understand them because you need to know that the condition is this, that there is nothing wrong mentally. The mind is perfectly all right. The problem is that the mind cannot make the body do what the mind wants to do and therefore speech and motion and other things are terribly difficult. And it's very easy to jump to the wrong conclusion that there is some mental blockage because of the lack of response. Now, spiritual spastic condition is exactly the same thing in the level of the soul. The soul wants to do certain things but cannot make the body do them. 
Or as Paul puts it, with my mind I serve the law of God, but my members seem to serve another law altogether. I want to be God's best, and yet I can't be. I want to be a saint, and yet I find it an awful struggle. I want to love God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength, but I find myself loving all kinds of other things. I want to live an upright, straight, honest life, but I just can't make it. And this despairing cry of Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, is the cry of every true Christian, sooner or later. If you've never known this agony, then as I've said before, ask yourself, am I really a Christian? Have I really accepted God's standards, or am I simply trying to do my best, rather than his best? Now the first passage in Romans 5, which I've just read, deals with this problem in one aspect, the aspect of love. And the real problem is this. On the one hand, my head says that as a Christian I ought to love everybody. But on the other hand, my heart doesn't. This is the tension. With my head I accept that we ought to love our neighbor as ourselves, that God loves everybody, therefore I ought to if I'm God's man. It's impossible, it seems to me, to love everybody in the world. <clears throat> my heart says it's impossible. And I'm even going to go further and say that my heart by itself can't even love everybody inside my own church. Never mind my own community or my own nation and the world that God has made. Well, that's just utterly beyond my heart. My head says I must love everybody. My heart says I don't like him and I don't like her. Is this not part of the tension of the Christian life? And a man came and said, who is my neighbor? You've told me to love my neighbor. Who is my neighbor? And he was hoping that Jesus would say, well, the man who lives next door to you and two doors away and the man who lives opposite and the man who lives next door on this side. But he didn't. He said, your neighbor is your enemy, your worst enemy in trouble. Your neighbor is the person who doesn't like you. Your neighbor is the person you never speak to. Your neighbor is maybe a Jew if you are a Samaritan. Your neighbor is anybody in the world who's in need of your love. And quite frankly, my heart is just not capable of that. And you can tell the difference between a church where the members live in Romans 7 and a church where members live in Romans 5 and 8 by this. In a church where the heart, the human heart, lives on its own love, the church will divide into groups cliques, small factions of those who like each other, those who have enough in common, those who live in the same kind of house, those who've had the same kind of education, those who like the same kind of music, those who have the same cultural interests. And the church will be divided into groups. And those groups will often get together in each other's houses, but only with their own kind. By nature, this is what our hearts are capable of. We are capable of loving those we like no more. And there is a limit to those we like. Now what is the answer to this terrible tension? I know I should love that person, but I don't like them. My heart closes up when I meet them. They're so irritating. They're so different. They're so awkward. I can't love them. What's the answer to this? Or must we go on in this tiny circle of those we like all our lives? The answer is in the Holy Spirit. And in this lovely little passage, we've got a glimpse of the answer to this tension and this problem. There are three trinities in this little passage. First of all, the trinity of faith, hope, and love. Did you notice that? Secondly, the trinity of Son, Father, and Spirit. And thirdly, the trinity of present, future, and past. Just to sum up the teaching of this um, paragraph, and those of you who are preachers, here's next Sunday's sermon coming up for you. Point number one, our past is dealt with through faith in the Son, Jesus Christ. Point number two, our future is dealt with through hope in God. But point number three, which is the important one, our present is dealt with through love in the Spirit. And Paul states here that those who really know what the Holy Spirit means will discover 
that he will do something in this matter of loving and liking, that he will pour God's love into your heart through the Holy Spirit given to you. And the very word pour means in a superabundance, a bucket full of love, not just eking out a little bit of love for someone, but he will pour God's love into your heart, and this is the answer. No human being has enough love for more than a few people, and a particular few of a particular kind. And so you look around when you're young for someone you could love and someone you could live with for the rest of your life. And the circle is quite limited. I don't think it's limited to one. I'm not those who think there's only one you could possibly live with for the rest of your life. But the circle is limited, very definitely. And it's limited by your capacity as a human person to love someone else and their capacity to love you and you might fall deeply in love with someone who couldn't love you unrequited love is a very big problem or they might fall in love with you and you just don't see anything in them that's human love but God's love is as wide as the world God so loved the world and it's his love I need not to try and love like him I had a conversation this uh, when I was away in Jersey with a French family they had the typical idea that most people have, that we've got to try and be good to get to heaven. And uh, the language barrier was a real difficulty. I just know a little French. The only sentence I know is je ne parle pas français. And that gets me a long way. And after that, I just shout louder in English, as most Englishmen do. And uh, this family knew very little English, but we managed to get by. And they told me they felt that if they were ever going to get to heaven, they must try and love. And I said, well, now you must love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And you must love your neighbor, and that means everybody in the wide world. The world is so small now, we know everybody is our neighbor. I said, can you do that? And they said, no. Well, I said, you've got a problem. If you've got to love people like that in order to get to heaven and you can't do that, what are you going to do about it? And they then said what many people say, well, surely God will accept us if we do our best. And immediately they've lowered God's standard to theirs. The real answer is this. My love isn't big enough. God, your love's big enough. Could you give me some of your love? And God's love is so big that he doesn't just give you a little tumbler full for you, a symbol full for somebody else. God's love is poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In other words, even as a Christian you will find that your heart is too limited in its love to love even everybody in your church. And those are the people where you need to love first. Charity begins at home for the Christian. The first people you are called to love are the brethren, the people you live with in your church and fellowship. On September the 18th, we're going to have house groups in this church, about 25 of them, scattered all over the uh, borough and outside. And incidentally, if you're not a church member and you'd like to be in the house group, will you let me know and I'll put you down for one of them. But we're just putting names down arbitrarily in a sense with other members, not with those they like. I'm quite sure if we asked you, will you now write a list of those you'd like to be in a house group with? You'd put down all those you like. There wouldn't all be those living near you. Sometimes members can live in the same street and not know each other, not love each other, because they don't like each other. So we're just going to put you in house groups. You're going to need the love of God shed abroad in your heart through the Holy Ghost. There'll maybe be a most awkward member in that group. Church always has one, and uh, more than one. <laughs> and in fact, uh, all of us are jolly awkward. But we're going to need the love of God shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost. Then you find you can actually love those you don't like. Why? Because it's not you loving them. It's God's love in your heart poured out into their lives. Well, now, that's the first frustration. I think I'd better stop there and we'll sing a little hymn. And uh, chapter 7, verse 6 reads like this, But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the spirit now i read on from verse 14 we know that the law is spiritual but i am carnal 
fold under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. So then it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin which dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ my Lord. So then I of myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God it does not submit to God's law indeed it cannot and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit. If the Spirit of God really dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although your bodies are dead through sin, because of sin, your spirits are alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit which dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Well, now, there was one day on my holiday when I wasn't preaching, so I got right away. And I had a most interesting day tramping along the beaches of Normandy. I visited the Sword and Gold and Juno. I saw the remains of the Mulberry Harbor at Aramanche. I saw Omaha and Utah beaches. I visited the military cemeteries of the British and the German and the Americans. I went to the first town which the British liberated, William the Conqueror's town, Bayer. Saw the Bayer tapestry with Bishop Odo comforting his troops and uh, had a very interesting day. But I remember standing in the American cemetery, 10,000 white crosses all around me. On the cliff top, looking over Omaha Beach, there were just a few sunbathers on the sand. But those 10,000 boys, ranging in age from 17 to about 35, most of them, those boys died on that beach just to get the beach. They landed in the early hours of that June day, and as the dawn came up, they were sitting targets for the German Panzer Division on top of those cliffs where now the cemetery stands. They fought and fought, but they knew if they stayed on the beach, it was death. They must either get up top or they must retreat. And on Omaha Beach, which was the toughest of all the invasion beaches, there came a point where the American commander was on the brink of ordering the troops to withdraw. Thousands of boys were dying. They were there to liberate the continent and they'd got no more than the length of this chapel up the beach. And then there was a breakthrough and they got up to the top. They were still fighting, but they were fighting a winning battle. Let me use that as an illustration. Romans 7 is the beach. Romans 8 is the cliff top. There is fighting in both. But whereas in Romans 7 it's a losing battle, in Romans 8 it's a winning battle. 
Whereas in Romans 7 there's an atmosphere of death. You can see the word die, death, dead, all the way through Romans 7. It's death to be on this beach, only to get so far into the Christian life. It's death to be there. You'd better not have come. But when you get up onto Romans 8, up the cliff, there's still a fight. But now the language is, in all these things we are more than conquerors. And it may perhaps be stated that the majority of Christians are still on the beach of the Christian life. And they're still living in Romans 7 and they haven't come out on top in Romans 8. Now look at Romans 7. What is the problem there? The problem is the battle is too great. And it is the worst kind of war which is civil war. It's tragic that there are people in Northern Ireland killing each other and they belong to the same nation, the same people. It's civil war. But there is one thing even worse than civil war, and that is worse than ordinary war. There is one thing worse than civil war, and it's a man at war with himself. That's the battle in Romans 7. And he's got this split personality that only the Christian has. The man who's not a Christian doesn't have this war. He has moments when he'd like to be better, but he soon comes to terms with them, and he usually lowers the standard enough for him to reach it, and then he's in a state of psychological equilibrium. And so the man that lives next door to you never goes to church is probably much happier than you are as a Christian. He probably has far less tension and frustration than you have as a Christian if you're living in Romans 7. This is a greater wretchedness than anything you knew before you knew Christ. And it's an awful wretchedness. My mind serves the law of God. I've accepted that standard. It's the only right way to live. His best, not mine. But my members just can't make it. I know what I ought to do, but I find myself doing the opposite. I really want to do good, but what I don't want to do, I find myself doing. That's the agony of a divided soul. Only a man who is a Christian has accepted the law of God as the only right way to live. The man who's not a Christian doesn't accept the law of God. He says it's too high a standard. Some of us were out yesterday on an exercise in Hyde Park Corner. Uh, we were there, about, I suppose, a hundred of us just practicing talking to anybody about Jesus Christ in the middle of Hyde Park. And there were two or three in the congregation here this morning there. And we were just going up to people and talking to them about Jesus Christ to see what their reaction would be and see how far we could get. And you know, everyone I talked to, their standard was their own standard. They just felt that God's standards, God's commands, God's laws were too high for human nature and therefore it was quite ridiculous to consider them. We must each live up to our best. We must each set our own standards and come to terms with life that way. But the Christian cannot do this. The Christian knows that God's laws are right and yet he can't do them. And here is the great problem. Thank God chapter 7 is not the last word on the subject. If it were, then Christians would of all men be the most miserable on earth. We would be more wretched than anybody else because the Christian on the beach, the Christian has only got so far to accept God's standards but not to discover how to keep them, is the Christian who will neither enjoy sin nor salvation. Can you imagine anything more miserable than that? Because these are the only two things you can enjoy in life, ultimately. You can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Don't let anybody tell you it's miserable to sin. For a time, it's great fun. That's probably part of the difficulty of it. But the man who's in Romans 7, he can't enjoy sin because he knows it's wrong, and he can't enjoy salvation because it doesn't seem to mean too much to him. And he's stuck in the middle. If you want to know why so many Christians do have long faces, you've probably hit on it here. Because they are more miserable than they were before they were converted. Because they're on the beach struggling for their lives. And sometimes the tension is so much to stay there that something cracks. In the middle of D-Day on the beach, on the Omaha beach, a soldier was seen singing softly to himself, crying at the same time and sitting out in the open, throwing pebbles into the sea. The tension of the struggle had snapped him. Too much. Well, now let's move on into Romans 8. You know, it seems in Romans 8 as if the thunder clouds clear away and the sun comes out. It seems in Romans 8 as if you've breasted that cliff, you've got up, and the enemy's on the run. 
You're still fighting and you're still in a desperate struggle, but now you're more than conqueror. It seems in Romans 8 as if you've come out of a cemetery into a garden where things are springing up in life. And instead of the word dead, death, dying, you've got the word life, living alive. Have you noticed the change? And the difference is this. In chapter 7, in the dis discussion or description of the struggle, the Holy Spirit is not mentioned. But in chapter 8, spirit, 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 19 times. In other words, once again, the answer to this tension is the Holy Spirit. You'll never get out of it yourself. So then, says Paul, summarizing the struggle at the end of Romans 7, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is no hope of doing anything else but that until we understand what the Spirit can do for us. Now let's see what the Spirit can do for us. A Christian is the only man in a position to serve one of two masters. He can't serve them both at once. He can either serve the flesh or the spirit. Now, a person who's not a Christian hasn't that choice. He can only serve the flesh. That's why he's not free. But a Christian is free, and he is free, therefore, to choose either. And alas, many abuse their freedom and choose the flesh. But he can choose the spirit. And if he chooses to live in the spirit, then he will discover that this tension goes Look at it in more detail. God has done what we could not do. That's the simple message of Romans 8. We were weak in the flesh. God has done what we couldn't do. Through his Son, he has dealt with the penalty, the guilt of our sin. But through the Spirit, he deals with the power of it. And the object of this is that the law of God might be fulfilled in us. In other words, that we might come up to God's standard. You'll never lift yourself to it. But he, by the Spirit, can enable his commands to be fulfilled in you. You will never keep even the Ten Commandments by yourself. There's no point in trying. You might manage six out of ten. I know of a man called Paul of Tarsus who kept nine out of ten, but I'm afraid when he got to number ten, it floored him. You will never keep ten out of ten, which is God's pass mark, except by the Spirit. Now, does this happen automatically? No. Romans 8 tells us that there are three things we must do if we are going to know this victory. There is something we must do with our head, something we must do with our feet. I'm sorry, let's give it to you in the right order. Something you must do with your feet, something you must do with your head, and something you must do with everything in between, which just about covers it. The first thing is what you are to do with your feet, then what you are to do with your head, then what you are to do with everything in between. And the three things he says are with your feet, walk after the Spirit. With your head, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. And with everything in between, mortify the deeds of the body that you may live. So that there is no sudden flash in the pan experience which will suddenly get you up on the cliff and keep you there, on the victory side. Alas, and I don't want to be discouraging, but I want to be realistic. Alas, many Christians I meet are hoping that one single experience will help them to have the victory. Well, it may help, but it won't give them the victory permanently. They go to convention after convention. They go to this place, that place, always seeking for something that will suddenly put it all right. And forever after, they'll have no bother. I don't know of any such experience being filled with the Spirit of... I don't know of any such experience being filled with the Spirit or anything else. I know of no experience that by itself one puts you right in this regard. Take the first word, walk. If you walk after the Spirit, then you will find you're in the victory, you're in chapter 8. But walking is not a thing you can do once, in a split second, in one single experience. To walk is to go on step by step in the right direction. And what it means simply is this. At moment after moment in your daily life, you will come to a fork in the road, and the flesh will say, come my way, and the spirit will say, come my way. And if you're going to know Romans 8, every time you come to that decision, you must walk after the spirit. Every time he leads you, you will need to follow to know the victory. 
The Christian can do this. The, the person who isn't a Christian couldn't possibly do it because the Spirit would not walk in front of them and show them where to go. But the Christian can. And the Christian who wants to live in Romans 8 every day of their life will need to step out after the Spirit. It may be quite literally where you go with your physical feet. You may be in a situation where the flesh would take you down one street and the Spirit would take you in the opposite direction. There are many places of temptation where the Spirit and the flesh would literally lead you down a different street in Guildford. And you may have to walk after the Spirit. You would have to, to know the power of the flesh. But the word walk is also a metaphor, and it means every time you come to the crossroads of decision, and the Spirit says this way and the flesh says that way, you will need to take the right step at that point if you're going to stay in Romans 8. Take one wrong step and you'll be back in Romans 7 and you'll feel wretched, you'll feel unhappy and you'll say, why should I be like this? But every time you take a step in the right direction after the Spirit, you'll know Romans 8 and you'll be more than conqueror. That's what to do with your feet. Now the second thing we're told here that we must do to live in Romans 8 is the other end of us, what we do with this end, our mind. Again and again the Bible makes it quite clear that the real place where battles in your life and mine are fought and won are in our thought life. Not so much in what we do as to how we think. It is the pictures hanging on the gallery walls of our memory and our mind that are going to be crucial in the battle. You see, before our armies invaded Normandy, they had mentally invaded Normandy again and again and again. They had thought about the battle. They'd seen pictures, photographs taken by midget submarines. They, they'd been told about what they were going to face. They'd memorized it all. People who'd never set foot in France knew all about the Normandy beaches. They had mentally fought the battle long before they got there. And they were ready for it when they did. And therefore we must realize that when we are in the place of temptation, the place where the battle is fiercest, it will depend on what we have done with our mind before the battle begins as to whether we win it or lose it. If you set your mind on the things of the flesh, then when the crisis comes, you will follow the flesh. Jesus said this again and again, but he was only repeating the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs. As a man thinketh, so is he. The real person you are is the person who lives in here. Not the person people see. The person who thinks. The person who meditates. Now that is to be very practical, covers our reading it covers our entertainment. It covers the newspaper we take. It covers the magazines we browse into. It covers everything that enters into here and becomes a thought. And if a man is going to set his mind on the things of the flesh, then don't let him expect to live in Romans 8. But if he sets his mind on the things of the Spirit, then when the crunch comes, he will live in Romans 8. Paul says in Philippians, Whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is honest, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, whatever is good report, think on these things and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says to set the mind on the flesh on the one hand is death. It kills your spiritual life. You may come to church on Sunday but you won't feel it's alive. It will go dead on you. Your prayer life will go dead. Your Bible will go dead. Why? There's nothing wrong with the church. There's nothing wrong with the Bible or your prayers. What's wrong is that your mind has been set on something else for so long that it killed your mind dead. But to set the mind on the things of the Spirit is life and peace. Therefore, to set the mind on the things of the flesh is war. Because the flesh is hostile to God. It's in rebellion to God. It's in a state of war. The flesh has declared UDI against God. And it cannot come to terms with God. Jesus said, look, it doesn't matter if you've never murdered someone, if you've wished anybody dead. You're a murderer. You've set your mind on the things of the flesh. You may never have committed adultery. You're horrified at the thought. But have you ever looked at someone wrongly? If the wrong thought has been in your heart, then you're an adulterer. Jesus consistently went right through the act to the thought life that lay behind it. This is where the battle is lost or won. So if you're going to live in Romans 8, number one is to walk after the Spirit. Every time you come to a choice, take the Spirit's path and not the flesh's. Secondly, even before you come to such a crisis, make sure that your mind is being set 
on the right kind of thought. Otherwise, when the temptation comes, your thought life is already so much in that temptation that you can't resist it. And the third thing you are to do is, with everything in between your head and your feet, mortify the deeds of the body. Every Christian is called to be a murderer, not of other people, but of himself. Every Christian must take the knife and plunge it into himself. Now, once again, there have been those who thought this was meant quite literally. Martin Luther flogged himself with a whip until he fell, fell unconscious in the monastery cell. And others have done this. I heard of someone only this week who's done exactly the same thing. But we are meant to take this in the deeper sense. We are literally to be as serious as Martin Luther was in cutting out, in killing anything, anything at all that is against the spirit. Jesus said you'll have to be your own surgeon. If your eye is looking at something, it shouldn't cut it out. He didn't mean blind yourself, as people have done that discovered. He meant cut out what you're looking at. Cut it right out. Drastic surgery is needed. Mortify the deeds of your body. Kill it dead. Sometimes the cells of our body become too lively physically. And it's vital that a surgeon or radiotherapy treatment kills that, kills it dead before it spreads and does the damage. It's the only thing that can be done. You must kill that life before it ruins the whole body. And as a doctor, a surgeon would be desperate to kill that ugly, evil thing that's growing in the body. So we are told in Romans 8 that by the power of the Spirit, as soon as there is an evil thing growing in your body, mortify it, put it to death, kill it dead, get rid of it before it spreads, and by the Spirit you can live. Go on living before your spiritual life dies on you. I must close. We're getting to the end of it now. One more thing I want to say. There is a paragraph, verses 9 to 11, which I think we must look at now to sum it all up. There are two key words in this paragraph. They're just little words, but since this is the word of God, every word matters. The word in and the word if. And you might overlook those words, but they're the most important words. You are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God really dwells in you. In if. Now there are two statements made here, and the first is that if you're not a Christian, you couldn't possibly know Romans 8. Because if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. If you don't belong to Christ, to reverse that statement, you couldn't possibly claim the power of the Spirit. You don't have it. The Spirit is not of you because Christ is not in you. And until Christ is in you, until his Spirit has taken up your heart and been invited in, you couldn't possibly know Romans 8. But there's something more than that because, alas, not every Christian is living in the Spirit. Christians can live in the flesh. Or as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians, which we'll look at perhaps in three weeks' time, you are either a carnal Christian or a spiritual Christian. There are still two sorts of Christian, and a carnal Christian is still in the flesh, even though he belongs to Christ. A spiritual Christian is in the Spirit. Now, you are not in the flesh if the Spirit really dwells in you. Now, some people may quarrel with my words here, but I think not with the sentiment. But I believe that the Spirit does not dwell in every Christian. Not in the meaning of the word dwell. If the Spirit really dwells in you, it means he's there all the time and in every part. If somebody dwells in your house, then they're there. They can use every room. They make themselves at home. They're in the kitchen as well as the front room. They're not just an honored visitor. They dwell there. And therefore they are welcome to the whole house. They share all the life. They are there all the time. Now, to many Christians, the Spirit is something of a visitor. Now and again they feel his touch. Now and again he comes to them. Now and again they feel, oh, the Spirit is really near me now. And then he's just a visitor because they keep him in the front room. Maybe they keep him in Sunday, but Monday, well, that room isn't quite fit for him to dwell in. So... We'll keep him in Sunday and we'll hope that next Sunday we'll have a touch of the Spirit again. If the Spirit really dwells in you, Monday as well as Sunday, 
every day of your life, every part of your life, if he really does dwell, then he gives life. Your spirits are alive because of righteousness. You know, that sentence, I know it's in Bible language, but let me put it into simple terms. The only man who's really alive is the righteous man, the man who's living right. Now, I've heard so many people who've told me that they've got the impression that if you really want to see life, you must do wrong. If you really want to live, you've got to taste all kinds of sin. If you really want to be alive, you've got to do what God says is wrong. Don't you believe it? That way is death and war. If you want proof of this, let me give you an illustration. You only need to walk about 250 yards from this church to a, a bookshop full of paperback books and you just need to look at those covers to read the text to set the minds on the things of the flesh is death and war. But to set the minds on the things of the spirit is life and peace. You can go to another bookshop in the opposite direction and you will find the word life as often as you find the word death in the other bookshop. And those who think that to live, really to live, you've got to do wrong, just don't understand the Bible. God says the Spirit makes us alive because of righteousness. And even your mortal body gets the effect. Even though your body is dead because of sin, the Spirit who raised up Jesus, if he really dwells in you, will quicken your mortal bodies. Even this body will have new vigor. In this life and in the next life it will have a new body altogether. But even in this life the Spirit quickens your mortal body so that you are vigorous and healthy. I'm not saying that every Christian will enjoy perfect health but I will tell you this, that those who live in the Spirit will have more physical energy than those who do not. Because the Spirit quickens your mortal body as well as your spirit. So finally Paul says, why live according to the flesh? What do you owe the flesh? Brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. What did the flesh ever do for you except bring you to wretchedness, death and despair? We are debtors to the Spirit. We owe the Spirit our life here and hereafter. Then let us live according to the Spirit because we owe the Spirit everything that we have that's worth having. And we owe the flesh everything that we have that's not worth having. So why? Why live according to the flesh? Here then is the problem. Spiritual spastic who want to do good but can't, who want to love everybody but can't, who want to live but can't, and who find that their spiritual life's going dead, what's the answer? The answer is to walk after the Spirit, to set the mind on the things of the Spirit, and by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body, and then we shall live and be more than conquerors through him that loved us. Let's just sit quietly and think about that for two or three minutes while the children are joining us for worship.